Welcome everyone to this webinar hosted by the Danish Institute for International Studies. My name is Adam Fierskov. I'm a senior researcher at DIES. I'm hosting this together with my colleague, Robin May Scott, who you'll hear from later. In case you don't know, we're a research institution based in Copenhagen, Denmark, working across issues of global development, foreign policy, security, and of course, technology. This webinar is entitled Treacherous Sea of Data, Race, Gender, and Inequality in Emerging Tech. And it's part of a series of webinars under the umbrella of gender and insecurity that we're hosting this fall. We're really excited to see so many out there behind your screens. I hope all of you and your families are well. I'm sure we can all feel the implications of a resurgence of, uh, of COVID-19 right now. One of the positive things emerging from the pandemic, of course, is that we're beginning to realize that we can actually take advantage of being connected across the world. And as such, we have a great set of speakers today for this webinar. We have Wyndon Twine, who is a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, who does research at the intersection of race, class, sexuality, and gender inequality. We have Catherine Dignacio, who is an assistant professor at MIT, doing research on feminist technology, on data literacy, and on civic engagement, among other things. And together with our final speaker, Lauren, she has just published the book called Data Feminism that charts the course for more ethical and empowering data science practices. I encourage all of you to pick that up. And finally, we have Lauren Klein, who is an associate professor at Emory University, working within the digital humanities and co-author with Catherine also of the Data Feminism. So we're really excited to have everyone here. But before we jump to the excellent speakers and the rest of the programs, let me just say a few words about our focus here today. We want to explore issues of ethics and of justice and equality in what we sort of have called the sea of emerging tech and big data. And um, I, I want to start with a favorite juxtaposition of mine. So during the Arab Spring, social media, especially Twitter, but also very much Facebook were sort of hailed as the new coming of democracy. They greatly helped facilitate revolutions essentially by both bringing disparate movements together, but also by allowing people to disseminate events and human rights violations to the rest of the world. Now, if we fast forward some eight years, we have a situation in which the United Nations publicly states that Facebook was a major facilitator of the Rohingya genocide in Myanmar that led to, amongst other things, the displacement of more than a million Rohingya. Simply that Facebook proved invaluable to build the necessary hate and legitimation for violence against the Rohingya minority. So out of absolute necessity, our focus today is on the mutual constitution of technology and society. That is how technologies essentially shape the social political realities we all live in. As we sort of write in the invitation to this webinar, data misrecognition makes people invisible. It contributes to discrimination, to harm, to social inequality. While data recognition can function as sort of technologies of hubris, aiming sometimes maybe to control people or allowing for it, or capturing them in systems that trespass privacy and can contribute, broadly speaking, to political, social, and economic exploitation. So we'll hear today about issues that are both internal and external to the tech industry, so to speak. Two concerns that are obviously deeply connected. The way the industry is organized and imagined greatly shapes the implications it has in societies all around the world. So I think I just wanna highlight three key fault lines that are at play and that you can maybe pay attention to if you want as you listen to the great speakers that we'll hear from in a moment. 
one fault line is between the technical and the political, right? That all technologies set out and represent imaginaries about social and political order. That means essentially just that you know, they carry with them deeply social and cultural and political values. But often this, uh, the technical side is attempted isolated from the political. According to my mind, at least, I think that's something that's more or less impossible. So a question such as how do we convince engineers that their work is deeply political just as much as it is technical? A second key fault line is sort of what we can call the individual versus the, or vis-a-vis -vis the collective or the intimate and the abstract, right? And that's to say that tech and its risks are often seen as having what we can call it very decontextualized nature. So when we speak in abstract terms about the risks and uncertainties and ignorance of emerging tech, we also have to remember that when negative consequences emerge, whether in the US or in Denmark or in Myanmar, they do so very locally and intimately with tangible effects on human beings. And we definitely see uh, a very particular distribution of values and of risks through emerging tech, both in individual societies and individual communities, but also on a global scales. So how do we make things more tangible in terms of understanding technologies and their effects. The third fall line, I think, is progress vis-a-vis -vis regression, we can call it. And that's just to say that technology is almost always about imagining the future, right? It's seen as a form of progress, as a movement that takes us all forward. But it's also important to remember Firstly, that technology necess doesn't necessarily take all of us forward. And also that, you know, these articulations of technological progress can function as political tools very much of repression and of regression. They can also maintain the status quo. They can preserve, they can strengthen existing power structures. So to me, those are sort of three key uh, fault lines to pay attention to maybe and what you'll hear over the next hour, hour and 15 minutes. So let me end by repeating some of the important questions that I think uh, we raise in, in the invitation. How are changes in the workforce we ask and in the workplace of big data lived experienced by a racially diverse and gendered workforce? Can we at all address the bias, bias, bias in, bias out phenomenon, should we? And all in all, how can we sort of navigate the paradoxes of emerging tech and big data that at least to my mind, maybe too often seem to have a built-in accelerator of inequalities of different kinds, more so than a decelerator. So those are some of the things we're gonna be talking about today. A few practicalities before we uh, move on. First, in one minute or so, Catherine and Lauren will talk about data feminism. After that, Winddance will talk about race, gender and power in Silicon Valley. And finally, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Robin May Scott, as we move to the Q&A, who will steer us very safe through that. And as you listen, you can write your questions by pushing the Q&A button on your screen in the bottom and typing in your questions. Um, and you can also upvote your favorite questions if that's something you want. So with that, I will hand it over to Catherine and Lauren. The, the virtual floor is yours for the next 20 minutes or so, I think. Please. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Adam and Robin, for this amazing invitation. Uh, one minute here while let me share my screen. Okay, Does, do you all see that? Yes? Yeah, okay. Um, Great. So, uh, so Adam did us the kindness of introducing us um, and 
what Lauren and I are gonna talk just a little bit about our recent book, State of Feminism, uh, which come, came out right in March, uh, right? As we were all going into lockdown. Um, and just as a little bit of background, I am based, uh, we're both based in the United States. Uh, I'm based at MIT in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. And I will let Lauren say where she is based. <laughs> Sure. Um, can everyone see Catherine's slides? This is, I can't see your slides, Catherine, but maybe it's just me. Oh, do other folks see the slides? It says that I'm sharing. I, I see them. You, see. you know, my I computer so. has been doing this all pandemic. So <laughs> I'm just, so let me know. <laughs> yeah, like, if at any point you stop seeing them, Adam, tell me, <laughs> I'll try to figure it out again. <laughs> so. Okay, no, no, no. I. Um, I, I don't really know what's going on, but this has been going, this is a persistent problem. In any case, hi everyone. Um, so um, so uh, as Catherine mentioned, um, we wrote this book called Data Feminism. Um, it's, uh, Catherine, did you mention it's available open access right now? Um, oh yeah. So There's if you're interested, links, yeah. um, if you're interested, you can um, go Google Data Feminism, MIT Press, and uh, find the whole book to read, although it's also, um, it exists in physical format right here. Um, so, you know, we thought we would talk a little bit today about um, just sort of uh, our motivation for writing the book and some of the things, sort of our process a little bit, and then we'll summarize some of the basic points. Um, and then uh, hopefully that will sort of set us up for a really interesting conversation a little bit later. Um, and we thought we would begin by just saying that we see data feminism as part of a, um, a growing body of work that is holding corporate and government actors accountable for their sexist, racist, classist data products. So we've already heard some examples about this already today. Um, you know, but additionally, things like um, face detection systems that can't see women of color, um, hiring algorithms that demote applicants that went to all women's schools, um, search uh, algorithms that circulate negative stereotypes about black girls, um, child abuse detection algorithms that punish poor parents, um, you know, all of these examples and more. And we should mention, you know, some of the books that you see at the bottom of the screen are um, some of the other scholars and journalists and activists who have, have called attention to these precise problems. Um, okay, Catherine, I'm going to send it back to you. Great. I'm going to take why I can't see these slides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, and maybe it's just important to explain the um, uh, slide a little bit here. Um, in many ways, you know, we see, we kind of situate our work um, with the folks down here whose work we are inspired by and who guided our work as we were doing it, but also as a kind of rising movement that is countering um, many of the things that were introduced in the introduction, the sort of what's coming out of Silicon Valley, um, the kind of culture of big data and artificial intelligence that we see embodied in what is essentially this meme from The Economist magazine, this thing of data is the new oil. And this is probably something people have heard if you're attending this conversation. This has been circulating for some time. Originally it was from The Economist and then it like kind of got picked up, especially in kind of corporate big tech circles. Um, and they mean this in a good way. Like they mean when they say data is the new oil, they mean um, data is something that can be uh, extracted like a natural resource. It can be mined. It can be cleaned, it can be processed, and ultimately it can be turned into profit. Um, but the question is always profit for whom? And like, this is what we see with this rising pushback, even just in the past five years, there's been just this growing pushback, um, much of which comes from black and indigenous women of color, from white women, from indigenous folks, from immigrant communities, LGBTQ communities and more, which are pointing out this idea that data is actually just the same old oppression. It's the same, um, it's the same power in new clothes. And in, in fact, uh, actually only helps to accelerate and exacerbate um, existing and deep inequalities. Um, 
And so where we kind of make a contribution to this pushback is in bringing in uh, intersectional feminist theory to think about, well, like how do we use this and apply it to our work in data science? What might we learn if we listen to what feminism has to say about power? Um, so Lauren, I'll pass back to you. Sure. Um, so we thought we would begin just with some very, very quick level setting about what we mean by feminism um, before we get to the main argument of, of the book, which is sort of about why data science needs feminism. Um, because everyone really brings their own genealogy of feminism to the table. Um, so uh, what is feminism? Um, Catherine, do you want to, should we just alternate? Sure. Um, okay. So first, we have a definition from Beyonce, and that's how you saw on the previous slide from her 2014 uh, MTV Music Awards tour. Um, she sings about feminism in her song Flawless. Um, a feminist is a person who believes in equal rights for men and women and trans people. So one definition is that feminism is a belief in equality. Uh, next. Okay. Um, and so here's a second definition. Um, feminism is also a political action. And then thirdly, feminism is also, so it's belief, it's action, and it's also a set of theories and ideas. And so these theories began by thinking through issues of inequality with respect to sex and gender. Um, but then the past 40 years of scholarship and our current political reality have brought many more dimensions of inequality into the conversation, including race, class, sexuality, ability, and so much more. So, you know, feminism is, is a belief in equality, it's action to, to manifest that equality, but it's also this great and rich intellectual heritage that we can use and mobilize in order to understand what um, to do and how to navigate the, the present moment. Back to Lauren. Okay, um, so this sort of leads to the most um, important takeaway from this or pricey of feminism, which is that in the year 2020, we need to understand feminism as intersectional. Um, and as some of you may know, um, this is a term coined by the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, um, which she uses to explain how social inequality cannot be explained by only one dimension of difference, such as gender. So um, when we're talking about inequality or oppression, we must be talking about the intersection of the many factors and forces that produce it. So this includes racism, classism, colonialism, and so on. Um, and then the key thing to understand about intersectionality, and this is actually the piece that is often missing, um, is that intersectionality doesn't just describe markers of individual identity and their effects. Um, so like, you know, I am cis woman, I am white, I, am, I live in the global north, I live in the US south, I have tenure, things like this. Um, so it doesn't just describe these markers of individual identity, it describes the structural forces of power and their intersection that create the effects that I experience as a result of those identities. Um, and it's really the work of women of color feminists broadly and black feminists in particular that have helped to foreground this conversation about structural forces, the root cause of the instances of either privilege or oppression that I experience, anyone experiences in their day-to-day -day lives. Okay, Catherine, back to you. So in short, intersectional feminism, so that's the underlying framework of the book, it's not just about women, it's also not just about gender, uh, it's actually about power, uh, who has power and who doesn't have power. Um, and so in today's world, data is power. And we can see that from that meme from The Economist, like it's power in just a very real and material sense of like, who are the companies that have the most money right now um, and the ways in which they leverage data uh, for material gain. Lauren. Okay, um, and so uh, our argument is pretty much that intersectional feminism when applied to data science can help that power be challenged and changed. Um, really, um, to put it another way, it's that data science needs feminism and intersectional feminism in particular, if we, over, if we ever hope to sort of overturn these power imbalances and begin to right the uh, imbalances of power that we are experiencing right now. So in writing the book, Lauren and I looked across um, a lot of different work, both in academia and in feminist activism. Um, 
and uh, especially looked at fields where feminism had been applied in more quantitative ways or in more kind of design oriented ways. So fields like human computer interaction, uh, economics, demography, uh, GIS and cartography. Um, and we came up with these seven principles that for us at least uh, encapsulate some of the most important aspects of intersectional feminism that we have to consider as we work with data and data science. Um, and so the goal here was not to necessarily make new feminist theory. Our goal is to take what exists and then apply it uh, to data science. So to provide a model that might guide the work of people who are already working with data, um, people who want to work with data or people who want to refuse to work with data because you know refusal is also a really important um, sort of political option in all cases is to refuse to consent uh, to something imposed on you. Um, and so the principles are here. Um, we don't have time to go through all of them, um, but this is basically also the structure of the book. So each um, principle gets a, is a chapter in the book. And as we, write, as we write in the book, we try to both kind of uh, describe the feminist thinkers that inform the principle and introduce the theory that informs it. And then also to show people who are working with data who are already doing this work. So people who are already examining power using data science or people who are already rethinking binaries when it comes to data science uh, and so on. Um, and then I think maybe the last thing I'll say before we jump into showing you some of the examples is um, there are two chapters about power uh, the first and second chapter, and that just reflects how central this analysis of power is to the feminist project. Um, so at its heart, really, the feminist project is about conducting an analysis of power in order to challenge unequal uh, power distributions. Um, so we're just going to show you some really quick examples that we talk about in the book and how those illustrate these principles. So I'll pass back to Lauren. Great. Um, so yeah, so one of the examples that we talk about the, in the book really early on is the work of Mimi Onuoha, um, who's an artist and educator based out of New York. And we tell the story of her efforts to collect what she calls missing data sets. Um, so these are data sets that a reasonable person might expect to exist. Um, but do not actually exist in real life. So the number of citizens killed by the police, um, this would seem to be uh, an issue of really pressing um, social and political need, um, but the government does not care enough about this to collect these data. Um, another example that is very topical, um, the number of women versus men with cases of coronavirus. We do not have systematic information about this issue. Um, and what Onuoha does is um, she undertakes an analysis of power in her project to ask why we have detailed data on things like the size of guinea pig teeth, um, but not on police violence or not on a uh, gender breakdown of coronavirus cases, right? And what she really helps us see is the reason why we don't have data on these issues is because there's a lack of political, governmental, and institutional will. So when we talk about forces of power, you know, what are the forces of power that are shaping our data sets and our data environments? These are the forces of power that we're talking about. Okay, Catherine, back to you. Um, but like we said, feminism involves action. And so when in the chapter um, about the second principle, challenge power, we also detail ways to push back against unequal power structures in data sets and in data systems. So for example, uh, the issue of feminicide in Mexico, um, so feminicide is, is gender-based killing. Um, the issue of feminicide in Mexico is another case of missing data sets. In the book, we tell the story of Maria Salguero who she resolved to head straight towards this problem of this, these sort of data gaps and collect the missing data herself. And so after five years of collecting, she, her, this individual person's repository has become the most authoritative public archive of feminicide in Mexico um, and has been used in a variety of different contexts and situations. Um, so we talk about this as a feminist counter data collection strategy. Um, so this idea that collecting counter data is one way to challenge unequal power. Um, 
it is not, maybe just the important caveat to say is that it's not the only way and all social problems are not addressed by collecting more data about them because we talk about sort of at length in the book how data, data are a double-edged sword. Um, you know, on the one hand, they may be used to expose injustice. On the other hand, they may be used to expose vulnerable people to powerful institutions that may inflict harm, um, that may be seeking them out. So um, collecting counter data is not the only way, but it is one powerful strategy to, to challenge power. So just really quickly, um, we wanted to make the point that data feminism and these principles apply not only to collecting and analyzing data, um, but also to the visualization and communication of data. And um, one of the key contributions of feminist thinking um, is to really take aim at false binaries and dismantle them. Um, and feminist philosophers and feminist theorists, they start with the gender binary um, and show how the binary is not a binary, right? There are more than two genders. Um, and then they also help show that usually behind a binary is a hidden hierarchy. Um, and the gender bi binary um, with men on top, um, women on the bottom and non-binary folks erased altogether, um, this is no different. But one of the sort of key moves of feminist theory is to take this critique of the gender binary and use it to dismantle other false binaries that um, we encounter in the world. And so one of the examples we talk about in the book has to do with the false binary between reason and emotion. And we use the two charts that you can see, um, but that I cannot, um, <laughs> to argue that um, emotion has been exiled from data communication, mostly thanks to folks like Edward Tufte um, and uh, sort of this long history of emphasizing um, minimalist design, sort of presenting just the facts, this sort of desire to convey objectivity. Um, and what we show is how both feminist philosophy and also visualization science, um, they've really worked to show through research and user testing and all of these things, how emotion is really central to perception, um, to learning and ultimately to understanding. So just to sum up quickly, uh, data feminism is a data science uh, that exposes and challenges unequal power. It takes its explicit goal of undertaking the work to be about challenging unequal power in the world, uh, whether that's racism, sexism, etc. cetera. Um, Data feminism is led by and centers minoritized people. We talk about that more at length in the chapter about uh, embrace pluralism, about participation, asking the question of like who makes the data science. Um, it looks at many axes of inequality, including gender, race, class, and more. So I mean, it's really uh, intersectional feminism is a project about justice more than anything else. Um, and then finally, data feminism considers process. So it's not only about the outcomes and the knowledge products we generate and where they go and who they impact, but it's about how we have a feminist, inclusive participatory process um, and how these sort of forces of power like racism and sexism permeate all stages of a data science project, everything from where the funding comes from to who leads the project, to who does the work and cleans the data, to who gets credited, to where the project goes in the world. Um, and so I think with that, we will wind up and uh, say thank you very much. And we're really looking forward to the conversation that's coming after this. Great, thank you so much, Catherine and Lauren. That was fascinating, a fascinating look into your book. And I believe there is a link in the chat to everyone who's listening right now where they can access it, open access. Is that what I heard? That's fascinating. I love that. Um, that's right. Yeah, you can just get it online. Yep. That's great. Next, we move to Windance. And we have a little bit of an issue with Windance's audio. So if it's not too loud or sufficiently loud, you could uh, just turn up. But Windance, the next 20 minutes or so are yours. And please go ahead. Of course, that's what happens. I think <laughs> wind dance froze.
all together. Let's just give her a second. I don't know if anything is going to work here. While we wait for Windanes to hopefully come online, I can just share a single thought. I think it was just also fascinating listening to what you said, Ronin and Catherine, with the sort of very dubious quote about um, oil. I can't help thinking. I think Windanes is going to lock out and uh, hopefully log in. I can't help think about the oil thing that, I mean, where I work on these issues is particularly in the global south, where you sort of, of course, have a history of far removed from technology to a certain extent, but within the field of medical technology have had these processes of bioprospecting, right? Essentially during colonialism, where doctors would venture out and they would collect samples of blood and slices of bodies and so forth. And, and it's just, it's impossible not to sort of be left with a sensation that the same sort of prospecting goes on today, but in a form where really data is a form of oil. One thing, because it's not just a dead thing you take somewhere, it's very much alive. And it's also very much of great value. I mean, in the, in the sense that it's inseparable from its capitalization from its form and its importance in contemporary capitalism, right? So it's just to say, I think this sort of the, it's a dubious, absolutely questionable quote about oil, but it also speaks to the sort of multiple meanings of, of the political practice of subtracting something from someone and who does the subtracting and who is actually exposed to these kind of practices. Totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's for us why we pulled that quote. We write about that quote in the book um, because it just illustrates so much and it illustrates how the culture of big data and big tech that has evolved and arisen in the past, whatever, 15 years of hype about big data, let's say, um, is, it is really one of extraction. And like those metaphors in a way are very appropriate um, because those, they describe many of the practices with data. It's like if we, oh, let's just like quickly gather this info. Let's just harvest that. Let's, I, you know, the, the prospecting is another kind of interesting one as well of like, we can just take what, it, you know, this people have called it like exhaust, like these things people leave around that no one is using and we can monetize those. Um, but it's also very similar as with oil, you know, these extractive industries do not have an equal distribution of uh, harms and benefits. Um, and so while certain groups are getting richer, there's huge harms that are being caused uh, to other groups. Um, I don't know, Lauren, if you wanna add more to that. Yeah, I mean, I'll just underscore that and say, I mean, I think it's very revealing that you don't need to switch the metaphor, right? You know, just thinking about the process and who it impacts, right? You know, people who benefit from oil refinement extraction, you know, these kinds of things are not hiding it from the people who do not benefit. And the flip side is that people who are harmed, the environment which is harmed, right? You know, it's very clear what the cause is. And I think the same is true for data, right? You don't need to, we don't need to sort of, it's not like we're, we're seeing, um, you know, two separate, it's two separate experiences, but the, the root cause is the same and that's not a secret. Um, and I, I do think that that's very revealing. And also I'm reminded of an, an immensely interesting article that one of my colleagues showed me about an insider from Microsoft who had been sent to, was it Kazakhstan maybe in, <clears throat> but I, yeah, I believe it was Kazakhstan to do sort of, or introduce, he was working for Microsoft to introduce some new, or, and also begin to implement a new system of AI that they would use in prospecting exercises. So essentially just geolo geological exercises, but the AI system itself in the end proved to be a very strong tool of monitoring and controlling workers on these sites essentially so that the technology that was essentially introduced by Exxon, I believe it was, worked as you know equally strong in the ways that it suddenly proved able to monitor and control where all employees were at all times during the sites. I think as we wait for wind dance, we'll bring in 
my colleague Robin. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't know if I'm on screen. We need your picture. You should probably there turn that on. Okay, there it is. Back. Okay. First of all, thank you, Catherine and Lauren, for your presentation and also for this great initiative in making your work available online. So I have had a chance to read your book online, although uh, while waiting for the uh, Dees Library to receive the copy I ordered. Um, but uh, of course, there's a certain irony. Anyone who knows me would say uh, there's a certain irony uh, in my co-hosting the seminar on uh, technology with Adam because uh, I'm certainly not a first mover in this area. Uh, five years ago, I uh, was uh, faithful to my Nokia phone, you know, the kind that you could throw out the window from the fifth floor and it would still survive. Um, but I'm a feminist philosopher. So while I don't know data science, I do know feminist philosophy and many of the concepts you work with, uh, perspectivism, situated knowledge, intersectionality, context, uh, um, uh, are of course crucial in this field. Um, so what I'm curious about is what does it mean when it's applied to data science, to your field of expertise? Is there something in that, in the data science part that which you know I have no knowledge of, uh, which changes these questions or uh, gives them a new dimension, or is it rather applying questions about epistemology, ethics, justice to this field? You know, and I could imagine it could be something like you know the the scope or the distribution, or that you know that dilemma, something is non-tangible, but as Adam was just saying, also quite tangible. So if you have any thoughts about that, I, I'm really curious. Yeah, thanks Robin. Um, yeah, I think, they, I think that's a really great question in terms of, you know, like in a way what we tried to do is take existing feminist work and apply it to this realm of data science. But I do think there's interesting, there's interesting challenges that come out of data science, I guess I would say, that probably deserve more time and attention as objects of thought for philosophy. And I think that work has already begun. Like, I mean, I think people are writing about algorithmic subjectivities and, and like, you know, kind of um, things like this, kind of like borrowing technological structures and concepts to sort of rethink what our commitments to these equalities are. And one thing that we don't actually really write about, but like, which I think people are doing a lot of right now too, is like also thinking about the role of the non-human uh, in this work as well. And we don't, we don't quite go there. We're pretty like grounded in the human, but um, I do think there are some things that come out of working with data like data that, that, that are things that we need to think through. So like one of the things being data are a collection, you know? So like when we're talking about something, we're not talking about like one isolated thing. We're always in a way talking about a collection of things that's been collected in a systematic way. Um, and so what does that imply? Like that, that implies that there's always multiple and then how do we think about that? And I think there are some challenges too to scale as well. And I think there are some tensions. So like, one of the tensions to me that I still am thinking about is the tension between coming out of computer science, for example, there is a, um, there's always a push. And I think this is kind of just kind of one of those um, unquestioned assumptions that scale is better. Like the bigger the scale, the better. Um, and also abstraction. So like decontextualizing things is a good thing. Like often in computer science, when you're writing code, like you wanna abstract something, you wanna black box it. So it can be more generalized. It can be like a tool that just gets an input and gives an output and you don't need to know what's going on inside of it. And that's seen as a good thing, generally speaking. But I think these are some, in a way like challenges of like, how do we think about these things from a feminist perspective? Um, and also how do, how do these things not get mired in maybe old debates in feminism that are binary debates, like whether quantitative or qualitative work is better, you know? Like, it, can we value um, multiple of these things? Can we value collections? Can we value large scales of things, but still do that in a justice oriented way? So like, I think these are some of the questions that for me come out of like, 
at least my own practical experience working in software development, that kind of thing, and then trying to connect that back into um, feminism and feminist concepts. Um, but yeah, Lauren, what about you? Do you have other things to add there? Yeah, I mean, this is all really great. I think that, you know, there is a lot more that could be said, but just to sort of riff on some of the topics you've said already. I mean, I think one of the things that becomes clear is just how much not just data science or AI, but sort of computation writ large could benefit and become more expansive if the field understood itself as it is, which is really narrowly constrained by sort of this dominant, dominant assumptions about what the field should do and how it should be constructed and what valid research questions are. You know, even this question of, you know, the focus on either abstraction, so we're going from the specific to, or the particular to the general, or the idea of scale going from the few to the many. You know, there are so many different ways, application, ways in which computation can be deployed that are outside of, you know, just that sort of single axis of inquiry, um, like that sort of that single vector. And so, you know, for my part, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, okay, so if we understand the strengths of computation to sort of see, they, it, they essentially they are, computation enables additional perspectives, right? And the sort of the way that Donna Haraway conceives of situated knowledge, right? Um, so it's not just going from like small to big or in to out or zooming like that, but each, each each approach that we're offered um, sort of gives us a new way of looking at things. You know, are there ways that we haven't thought of before that we might think of if we bring to get together feminist theory with computation in order to do this? You know, like it, you know, I'm, you know, in my work, I should be more specific because this all sounds very abstract. Um, but I do some work that pushes back against this idea that what big data offers is a um, sort of the the large scale view, and instead, what it can actually do is bring to the surface some things that are invisible, like with respect to issues of invisible labor, for instance. Sometimes you can't see this on the surface. Um, but if you take, if you sort of use computational methods and use the abstraction enabled, that is enabled by computational methods, you can sort of make forms of labor, forms of work that go into certain cultural productions that are more tractable. Um, so I just think there's this whole rich area of work and I think we could do so much more computationally if we were open to this idea that feminist thinking is expansive, it cracks open problems, right? It lets us see things in new ways and additional and new ways and multiple ways are always better than a single narrow way of looking at things. Um, there we go, thanks. Um, uh, so maybe we should just continue with some of the questions that are already coming up from uh, our audience uh, while we're waiting for wind dance. We have to be prepared that she might not be able to get back online. She said there were fires in California and so she was having technical issues. So, uh, but I see uh, Yana Kick writes, uh, it's also about this question of uh, the power of feminism in this field. Uh, you said, she writes, the principle of refusing to work with data is also an action. Refusal is also an action. And there are a lot of researchers who are skeptical about digital humanities, thinking that all digital humanists do is verify what has already been written. What do you think? Is data feminism something that can help in building bridges and convincing tech enemies? It looks like we've now lost Lauren. <laughs> I don't know where Lauren went. <laughs> this is like one of those days where our technology doesn't work. Um, but I, I'm sure she'll come back. So we'll, uh, I'll, I'll take the first shot at answering this. But I want Lauren to address the digital humanities question because really that's, uh, that's um, really her area. Um, on the topic of refusal, um, I think we're seeing more and more um, more and more growing sort of both theory and action around refusal. And I, I wanted to, like, we always try to point that out and maybe just, I'll say a couple of references for folks if you want to look more at refusal. There's um, a US-based movement called Data for Black Lives um, and their uh, sort of head 
uh, lead organizer, uh, Yeshi Milner, has uh, talked about abolishing big data and like really provocative. It doesn't actually mean never to use data ever, ever, it, but it, it means abol abolishing this current regime of big data. So it's like one really powerful way of framing it. I think um, Ruha Benjamin talks about informed dissent instead of informed consent, um, which is another, I think, very powerful framing. Um, there's another feminist group that uh, recently, in a second, I'll put a link in the chat, um, a group of social science researchers and media scholars came together and they made a, a feminist data manifest no, <laughs> like basically a manifesto that is about refusing big data practices. And it, that also is a very powerful document of refusal. And then some of their folks have gone on to do some, they have a paper under review, which I think is going to be really good, which is all about framing out kind of the theoretical basis for refusal uh, as a way of acting in the world. And so I think like these actions of refusal are powerful in the sense that um, when we refuse, we open up alternative and potentially generative opportunities for doing things differently, right? It's not only about just being like, no, but it's also about like, no, and not on these terms. And like, here's the other future that I uh, wanna see and happen in the world. Um, and so I think that's, you know, on, on the, the refusal front, some of the really important and exciting work that's going on, which is fundamentally, I think it's a really different stance or, or that work is coming from a really different place than the work that's about like, okay, let's like de-bias the algorithms, you know, like let's make these more incremental reforms to make things like very slightly better. And so those two, those are two like kind of very different politics that are being enacted there. Um, and then uh, Lauren, now that you're back, like there was this question, uh, I'm still answering that where I was like outlining some resources about refusal and like talking about the feminist data manifesto. But then um, there was part of this question that was about folks being skeptical of digital humanities thinking that digital all, all digital humanists do is try to verify what's already been written. Um, so I didn't know that you should respond to that. <laughs> so. yeah, sure. I mean, that's kind of what I was getting at before. And sorry about that. My computer randomly shut down. I just feel like this is um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, so now you get the, the inside view of my basement. Um, so, um, you know, in terms of just doing things, I mean, I think this is relates to what I was saying before, you know, I think that feminist theory, but not just feminist theory, you know, all sorts of different approaches, um, you know, critical race theory, queer theory, you know, lots of different historical research, um, cultural context. These are ways of offering us a new lenses to think through problems that we thought were closed and contained, but actually um, could be much broader and more capacious if we under if we sort of saw the ways in which these things were connected. Um, and so I would really, I mean, I feel like that's the problem, not with a field, but with just sort of bad scholarship. Um, and then the second thing that I'll say, and this actually relates to another principle that we talk about in the book um, in terms of pluralism, but it's also sort of um, a principle that is rooted in the value of community. Um, I think that a lot of scholarship that sort of tries to just sort of say, oh, look, now proven by science kind of thing has not taken the time to engage with an existing community, whether it is sort of the object of study or engagement or a scholarly community to be to in order to ask the question sort of what are the valid questions, what are the important questions, I mean, what are the open questions right and what you see if people scholars um, take the time to sit with a community either of scholars or of you know, uh, you know, people who they hope to work with, um, you know, you can really, I think that really helps to identify questions that are new and vital and pressing in a way that, again, I think we just sort of see, you know, scholars, and again, this comes back to, I, I feel like it's just going to be Haraway all the time, you know, it's a false divide between scholars in their ivory tower and, you know, people out there in the world, um, you know, real scholarship is constantly about this interplay um, between uh, communities and, you know, understanding that in order to do better work, you need to be out there and be connected. Um, I think this, you know, feeds back and results in scholarship that ultimately um, is more generative, is more capacious, and does answer new questions. 
Thank you. Uh, and we have another question here um, from uh, Ariana Karabi with a few thumbs up on it. Uh, Ariana writes, uh, what about women and other minorities in data science reproducing the same old structures in their algorithms? Could you comment on starting change from within? Because of course, this issue of women and minorities in data science has both workplace issues um, uh, as any other workplace organization. And I know these are some of the issues Windance works on, particularly what are, what are the cultural norms and how that translate into uh, uh, disparities of uh, privilege. But what about the science part of it uh, in terms of the algorithms? Robin, can I jump in here? Because I, I also wanted to just uh, catch that question because I think it's hugely relevant, both in terms of the, or mostly in terms of the sort of inside, outside, or the general positionality of people in, you know, either driving change or refusing change and so forth. I think it's, it's very relevant to some of the work that I do, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where I work together with colleagues on technologies and refugee camps, for example, where we have a, a great focus or an increasing focus on the importance of sort of localizing technologies to actually make them matter in the context where they are to be put to use. And, and some of the things that sort of come up there in terms of what it actually means to drive change from a local perspective or from a local perspective is also sort of that the, the difference between in a context, for example, of Kenya, between a refugee camp and Nairobi is as big as the difference between a refugee camp and Copenhagen. So it's sort of to not make that assumption that even, or just because you work with a startup in Nairobi, you are suddenly reflecting, you know, the opinions and the values and the needs of a local community somewhere, but that I think in this day and age, we have to be very, it's very interesting to think about positionality on a national scale, but of course also on a global scale in terms of those, those kind of matters. Because one thing of course is that we know the vast majority of startups in Nairobi are headed by white male Europeans, but there's also quite a lot of startups being, you know, essentially being founded, but also being driven by uh, expats. So I think it, this discussion about in, inside outside positionality, whether you can drive change from the inside or whether it's, uh, or if it's at all possible to drive it from the outside, I think that's, that's, that's really interesting. So yeah, so have your, to hear your reactions to those, Catherine and Lauren, that would be great. Sure. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think these are super important issues because like, on the one hand, I mean, I like the way that Ariane uh, frames this because, you know, on the one hand, it's like, we can't imagine that the women or the people of color who are sort of inside Google <laughs> are acting in the interests of like all women or something like that, you know, like they're, they're yeah. normed into these powerful structures and they're probably succeeding precisely because they're able to operate within structures that are inherently um, sort of oppressive or whatever. Um, so we can't imagine um, that they are, uh, it, yeah, like operating in, in some like liberatory way. And we also can't imagine that um, I mean, we write about this a little bit in the book that like there, there is a um, there is a legitimate problem of representation uh, in terms of like just physically speaking, whose bodies are in these companies making these tools that are scaling and traveling around the world. Um, the fact that they're made by mostly cis white elite heterosexual global north men um, that that is a legitimate problem, and we we should work on solving that, but. Um, it's not only about the pipeline, right? Like a lot of the way that this work gets framed is it's about like um, recruiting more women. It's about running more girls can code programs. It's about having Legos that are pink or whatever, you know? Um, and, you know, a lot of the way that that work is framed and a lot of the work that's about sort of representation in STEM frames it as a problem of 
women that they're leaving, <laughs> right? It's like women's problem that they can't uh, have more, like do more coding, that they can't stick around longer in these companies or whatever. Um, and almost never does the focus turn to the ways in which the workplace is structured to be pushing people out, to be specifically pushing out women and people of color. So I think like um, that's where I think I would like to see more work in this space is because uh, I because I do think it like ultimately it's deeply important who's at the table building the tools um but it's also about like reevaluating that context in which they're they're operating and like people are leaving for a reason um and it's it's not because they can't code <laughs> you know um and oh yeah now I've lost the question because I feel like there was another I feel like there's another part of it that I wanted to speak to. Where did it go? Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. And, and but and starting change from within. That was the part that I wanted to speak to. Um, that said, though, like I actually do think that there are ways to change from within. So like I think the um, and we write about that as well in the conclusion of the book where we talk about some of the really powerful activism that's coming from within tech companies themselves. So like the Google global walkout. Um, and some of these internal efforts to stop collaborations with um, ICE, for example, the U.S.'s uh, Immigrant and Customs uh, Enforcement Group. Um, and so these are, I think, very powerful actions from within that can have some effect on the, the big tech company. So um, I, I also think like, you know, kind of the reform from within or like these, my general and I think our general um, we advocate that one can do feminism from whatever your position in the world, basically. So within is a very viable political position as well. Um, yeah, Lauren, I'll pass to you. Yeah, I mean, just, just to reiterate, I think that, and we say this in the book, and I think we're quoting uh, possibly Maura Wiggle. I forget exactly who we are, maybe Mar Hicks, but you know, if data and computational systems are about power, the people in those companies are more proximate to that power. And therefore the smaller actions, those effects are amplified because they're closer to the source of that power. Um, and so, you know, for instance, a walkout at Google gets a lot more attention and a lot more sway than a company, even that sort of is in the tech industry that we don't, we don't see those products, right? Um, and knowing, recognizing that and knowing that you have, in effect, a much larger platform as a worker there than you might not otherwise, you know, that shouldn't be um, looked over. And then the other thing I would say to Catherine's point about sort of not placing the burden or the onus on the women or the people of color in order to do this work, you know, and this again comes back to power. It's the people who do sort of occupy positions of power who in many ways have more of a responsibility to expend some of that power or, you know, capital or, you know, to sort of engage another metaphor in order to do this work of change because they are the ones who are harmed less um, by taking more, um, more substantive or even more radical actions than, um, you know, the people who exist as a minority or who are minoritized in a particular company. And so a lot of the work that we do in the book and in part because we're trying to speak to um, you know, a broad audience, um, but we're trying to speak to the tech industry, to tech workers who are predominantly um, male and cis and white, you know, those are the people who also, who share this responsibility, right? Um, and I think, you know, should, we hope will be sort of feel themselves um, empowered to act in ways that they might not have um, or might not have felt the urgency beforehand. Okay, I'm going to uh, go ahead with a couple more questions from uh, our audience. One is uh, a more general question about knowledge and power from my colleague here in Copenhagen, uh, Beatus Lut Amundsen, and it picks up on some of the issues that uh, Adam already raised at the beginning. You know, is this liberating or is it the opposite? Uh, Beata writes, uh, again, uh, could you uh, uh, say a little bit about the general debates about power of knowledge and the role of big data here? Uh, knowledge has been heralded, she writes, it's a road to liberation, but big data is another story. Um, so could you say something about your views about where do you think it actually does show itself as having liberating potential and where does it show actually uh, the opposite, that it uh, um, 
gives further power to forces of violence and oppression. And I think rhetoric surrounding big data really instructed this larger conversation about power, right? Because it really, it sort of lives out the, the critique of certain kinds of power or certain kinds of knowledge rather being valued other, over other kinds of knowledge and the assumptions that are sort of baked into certain ways of knowing and that are sort of um, set to the side and others, you know? And we actually, we try to do this in the book, sort of take these feminist critiques of hierarchical power and say, look, th this, th this is playing out in big data, right? You know, big data is not all data, right? It, big data, does, it, there are certainly gaps. Um, it helps to show us some things which are valuable, but it certainly does not show us everything. And we gain more knowledge. And again, sort of to reject this, this choice between it's between big or small, qualitative or quantitative to say, the goal is always more complete knowledge. And we are never there, right? We are never at that goal. We will never reach it, but we can always be working towards it. Um, and if you understand that whatever data set you're working on um, captures certain things, but not everything, and you can supplement that and augment that with either the context surrounding the data, the knowledge that comes from lived experience. Um, you know, we talk about a project, we didn't have a slide on it, but that juxtaposes, or not juxtaposes, but brings together data points with video essays. Um, you know, what data, knowledge that is derived from data really requires is this feminist critique of knowledge, right? In order to say, you know, knowledge is, is um, heterogeneous. It comes from many different places and we should be very suspicious of forms and structures of power that tell us certain knowledge is better than other knowledge, or this is somehow more valid or more scientific or more um, expert, right? Um, and these are critiques that we know from feminism um, and that have not been applied as um, strongly and as uh, consistently as they need to be um, with respect to, uh, to big data and sort of how we, we, and I'm speaking as like as a society sort of are constantly being presented with sort of data-driven knowledge or the data says do this or the data says do this. And we don't ha yet have sort of a rich enough um, uh, sense of both what the data is telling us because it, it, it does tell us some things, but then what it's not. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add to that. Um, yeah, I think uh, we need to be careful about, and this is kind of what I was getting at when I was saying like more data is not better or like just because we collect counter data like, like collecting counter data is not always the solution to every problem right um so i think like where data science does have the possibility of working towards justice is when it's deployed in an explicitly counter hegemonic way like where there is a there is a critique of power that has happened and like an explicit engagement with power and you know in other kinds of efforts i worry um, when they're not proceeding with that, I guess, because I'm not sure without that kind of critique how one can possibly hope to be liberatory. But then the other question I think is, um, you know, one of the things we also we say in the book is uh, feminism asks who questions. So like who benefits, who is harmed, who does the work, who benefits from the work, who's credited with the work. Um, and in the case of knowledge, you know, like, and, you know, just kind of like gathering, let's say gathering data, gathering information, interpreting that in some way, the question is always like, who benefits from that? Um, and that we see the same kind of like knowledge power dynamics repeated and like sort of exacerbated in the field of big data. So in our chapter about embrace pluralism, we contrast a project, uh, about, like two projects about eviction data, basically one that's done in a very kind of um, community-based way. It has an explicitly activist lens and it's about kind of like connecting a community in San Francisco to each other and to data about eviction and uh, kind of developing a kind of shared understanding and building coalition around that to strengthen their movement on the behalf of the rights of tenants versus a kind of uh, research project that is also a very important research project that's located at Princeton, but is really much more about sort of like um, extracting the data so that we can have a national picture of eviction. And so like, if we think about like, who are these data for? They're, they're ostensibly about the same thing, but like they're for very different audiences, right? Um, and they could, they potentially influence very different uh, people. The one at Princeton is much more for like 
uh, elite knowledge producing academics, whereas the one in San Francisco is much more for the folks on the ground in order to be able to take action. Um, and so I think that's those like who questions also need to be at the center of any of these efforts to use knowledge for liberation, because I think there can be liberation, but but who's liberation? <laughs> and then just because like we know about something, like we know a lot in the US about segregation, but it's not like, you know, no one's taking like big bold steps to actually do it. Like we have described the phenomenon, it shows up everywhere. Racial segregation shows up across, you know, all of our geographic data and our zip codes and our schools and all these things. Um, but like ultimately like the data don't save us, like knowing about it <laughs> doesn't save us, right? So like, there's also this thing of like the data alone don't do the work. It's the, the, the political work that needs to happen beyond that. Thank you. Uh, great, uh, great answer. Uh, we have another question here from Juliet uh, Lauren uh, about, about the question of uh, women as um, uh, uh, workers in tech areas. Here she's talking about uh, telehealth, telehealth. She writes that she works in telehealth for psychologists and the majority of psychologists in Denmark are women. Uh, but that many uh, mature women are averse to using uh, digital platforms. Um, so are there tech areas where women dominate the field and uh, could this be a, a, a force for, for growth in this context for better health care, better mental health care? Catherine, do you wanna go or should I? Actually, Lauren, I was thinking maybe you could talk about some of the like early women computers. Yeah, like, sure. I mean, I, I love I this question that. because in a way, you know, what we're, I, I mean, I feel like the question is, are there tech areas where women dominate the field? The, the statement is really women have already dominated these fields and that is why they are no longer there. There is a long historical pattern of women and non-binary people, essentially any minoritized group um, innovating as a result of conditions on the ground. Um, and as the value and the utility of those innovations become recognized more broadly, the innovations themselves get more formalized, get sort of separated from the people who um, came up with these ideas in the first place, become more sort of based on credentials. And then as a result, because of this sort of separation, and again, this is another sort of desire to binarize as we, because of power to sort of, uh, consolidate power. Um, and then the women are the ones who get pushed out. So to make this a little bit concrete, um, like the Ur example here is um, the shift from midwifery to obstetrics, right? So women were helping birth babies for millennia, right? But it was only after this knowledge became um, recognized as valuable, shifted from the home to medical schools, became a place where who can go to a medical school, a man can, that now then, you know, what do you get in a med medical school, a credential? Oh, let's value the credential. Therefore, the midwives get pushed out of or devalued in relation to people with um, obstetrical degrees, the difference between a home, a home cook and a chef, same exact process. And we see this, you know, I mean, you can, any field, you can find this, right? Um, you know, I could talk about this historically with respect to the, early women computers who actually were women who were uh, abstracting computational tasks because they essentially they were secretaries who had been given these large you know room size computers and they were being asked to um, do the same mathematical and somewhat you know their physical tasks like putting in cables connecting patch bays, things like this. And they realized they kept on doing the same work over and over again. I thought, oh, we could abstract this into an algorithm essentially. Um, and then the men thought like, oh, hey, you know, look, they're saving time. Um, you know, let's take this knowledge and step. And so then the women, the men became, became um, trained as computer programmers and the women were pushed out. And I could keep on going now, you know, you see this in this dynamic all the time, like the difference between um, like web development began as a field that um, initially was uh, because it involves sort of this expressive medium, 
um, many women on the internet in the 90s um, were like, hey, I could teach, I could make, I could do this myself, I could teach myself, I could make these really awesome web pages. Um, and women re really began to sort of dominate this field. And then it became, again, sort of professionalized, taken away. Um, and you, I mean, you just see this play out over and over and over again. And so I think that, um, you know, rather than, and this connects to a larger point that we make, sort of rather than see the deficit, um, say like, where are the women now? I think the key is to say, you know, where have women innovated in the past and how can we recapture that? Um, or where is the next mode uh, or sort of method of innovation in this new technological context that we're sitting in? Um, you know, and I think, again, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if we see a lot of innovations, particularly with respect to telehealth, um, I, it wouldn't surprise me if we see these uh, some new things that we don't know about that I think we're all learning about now because we're all on Zoom and we're all having to do this like crazy mediated human contact right now. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of really interesting tech companies um, sort of coming from women and other minoritized groups um, and that will eventually get absorbed into the mainstream and then the women go sort of get pushed out of this. Anyways, that was a long answer, but I'm sort of passionate about this. It's one of my uh, one of my uh, hobby horses or whatever you want to call it. And you should probably mention your next book. <laughs> oh, right. Um, I'm working on a book about the history of data visualization, actually, um, uh, where I look, I go back to um, women, indigenous communities, um, sort of people out of the mainstream who really were innovating visually and in terms of data visualization and came up with schemes that are so different and so much more capacious than anything we really have right now. It should be the first chapter should be launched pretty soon, but not yet. Um, Robin, your microphone. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, before we move into where, you know, the closing part of this, uh, we do want to uh, give Elise Anderson the chance to get an answer to her question. Um, and it's again, the question of uh, reaffirming or uh, breaking suppressive structures. And I know we spoke about spoken about this uh, already in your uh, overall discussion. But if I recall, and, and and you must correct me, I've read about initiatives where they're really concrete uh, guidelines for working with uh, programmers. You know, kind of uh, litmus test rules. Remember to put together a programming group uh, that consists of you know a diverse group, and that ask these kinds of questions. Is that uh, work you've done? Uh, we haven't done that specifically. I mean, I think this, um, yeah, this is a really interesting question. I feel like this gets at one of the questions you all were asking at the beginning as well, in terms of like, you know, how do we um, take these data and potentially, uh, de-bias them or like how, like, can we, can we take an input that has discrimination built into it and then produce an output that is fair? Um, and I mean, as with all questions that probably like the most appropriate thing to do here is to like, think about it in context, because like, I think different issues have different stakes and different data sets have different stakes for different people. Um, and so like in some cases, for example, you know, there's, there's been some really interesting work on, um, you know, there's a big story. It's one of the things we cite at the, as like the work that has inspired us. We read about it in the book, this machine bias story that ProPublica did. Um, now it's now been like four years ago where they looked at uh, risk assessment algorithms, these algorithms that give um, people who are detained a risk score and say whether they're likely to reoffend and like they make a bunch of decisions in the judicial process about whether to like you know let people go on bail or not based on this risk assessment score. So the ProPublica study found that um, these were um, highly discriminatory against Black people. Um, and so then there's been some follow-up work from like a research side of things to really look at why the, there really is not a way to de-bias that data. And, and it has to do with just how flawed and racist policing practices and mass incarceration is in the US context. It's sort of like, how do you remove the highly racialized nature of this practice from that data? Like you really can't 
do that, you know? And so it's like, in some of these cases, like there is no way, like we, that's, that's one of those cases where I think like refusal becomes one of the most appropriate options of saying like, we should not go here with technology. And like, that's something too, that um, the group, the Algorithmic Justice League has been advocating for this sort of like refusal, just like a kind of full stop on technologies like facial uh, recognition, um, just because like they have been shown to be so flawed. And so the potential for harm is so great by uh, powerful agencies like law enforcement and things like that to, to inflict harm. And, and it like kind of goes with this longer, deeper his history of already doing that, <laughs> you know? Um, and, but then at the same time, like, I don't want to foreclose that there could be some situations in which we could manipulate the data in some math ways, like mathematically speaking, to build sort of more fair things. But I think it's like these high stakes contexts, um, it, it, there's not a way, like, you can't undo 300 years of oppression with math, <laughs> I guess I would say, right? <laughs> So like, that's, that's my answer. So like, it's like, but I, but I want to foreclose that like that, those mathematical ways I think can be used in other situations where potentially the stakes are lower and the consequences are potentially lower as well. Um, so Lauren, I don't know if you want to also weigh in on this. I think that's a really good line. I mean, maybe just the one thing that I will add to this is this idea that there is this sort of universal idea of what is fair. I mean, this is another sort of, uh, false assumption, you know, like there is this idea that we can get to pure objectivity, you know, these are aspirational goals, but, you know, there is not some sort of, you know, metric that will say like, poof, algorithm is fair, right? These will always be contested terms. And this is true for anyone. Um, and so I think, again, you know, we try to do a little bit of this in the book, reframing the goal, um, not as sort of an unachievable fairness, but if the goal is something like equity, right, trying to rebalance intentionally, um, or if the goal is, um, you know, accountability, trying to build in methods for impacted communities or the communities who are impacted by, you know, whatever data-driven systems we might see um, to, you uh, I'm sorry, the, the changing of the guards is happening at the end of the talk um, uh, to sort of to understand that like if we are intentional and specific in the goals of any particular project, we are much more likely to be successful in those terms rather than uh, framing everything in terms of these sort of unachievable generalities. Adam, did you uh, want to come with a comment yeah. before we have a final wrap up here? Yeah, I think, yeah, just on the verge of wrapping up, I, I just have a, a brief comment and it's not something you have to necessarily respond to anyone, one of you. It's just to say that, you know, it's very interesting the way we talk about reaffirming and reproducing and repeating, you know, whether it's discriminatory data and so forth. And I think that's absolutely true, but, but there's one thing we're sort of also missing and, and it's a word that we haven't maybe said yet, and that's experimental, right? And, and that's completely selfish because I'm finishing a book on the inequality of, of the experimentation on a global level. But I think it's just, it's very interesting to see that the employment of so many of these different kinds of instruments, whether it's within data science or outside or in technology work, broadly speaking, they are also very much forms of social experimentation where it's not just about reaffirming and reproducing, but also producing new realities the consequences and avenues and paths of which we do not fully understand because they are so loaded, not just with risks and uncertainties, but with ignorance, essentially. So I think that's really important. If we look at COVID-19, for example, in Denmark, when we had a lockdown, it was at a press meeting where our chief epidemiologist came forth and said, this is not a political decision. This decision is based on a mathematical model. So there's no guesswork. This is not an experiment. And of course, this mathematical model did not consider the role or the implications in terms of what lockdowns would mean for violence against women and so many issues. But it's just to say that, of course, the COVID-19 response altogether has been one big social experiment. So I think it's also interesting to talk about reaffirming and reproducing, but also about these practices in the way that they are very much experimental because we have so much ignorance and uncertainty built into them that we cannot see exactly where they're heading. So Robin, do you wanna finish off? 
Thank you. Well, that's uh, thank you for a fine conversation. And of course, thank you to all of you who stuck uh, with it uh, through this uh, a seminar, which um, in dinner, is getting to be dinner time in Denmark. Uh, of course, we have experienced, we have embodied the fallibility of technology. We have experienced the missing voice. You know, we had wind dance with us <laughs> and then we lost her. Uh, but of course, uh, we at least have the consolation that we have planned some follow-up collaboration. But uh, really a big thanks to Catherine and Lauren for uh, your great discussion. I think, you know, we have at the end of your comments, uh, some priceless gems. We can't undo 300 years of oppression with math and uh, aspirational goals and reframing uh, the picture. So I think that gives us a lot. I would like to also give a big thanks to our conference section, Trina and Amelia, who are very professional. Adam, my uh, collaborator here, and everybody in the audience for participating. So uh, thanks and have a good evening or a good day. Thank you for having us. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Be safe. Take care.